Hello everyone, um, good afternoon uh, if you're watching from the UK um, and uh, good day or good evening if you're watching um, from elsewhere. Uh, my name is Joe Chris and I'm the director of the Festival of Debate. We are a politics uh, festival that is based uh, in, in Sheffield in the UK and the festival was aimed at creating a platform for people to come together and discuss the key, discuss the key social, historical, economical and environmental issues of the day. Um, all of our online events are free at the point of access to and attend, but if you can afford to make a small donation towards the Festival of Debate, that would be much appreciated and you can do so by visiting www.festivalofdebate.com. Um, I'm now very pleased to introduce our hosts uh, for today's event. Um, please like to welcome uh, Scrap. Um, Scrap, if you'd like to uh, turn your video and microphone on, and that would be lovely. Over to you. Um, welcome everybody to our event. It's time to act for true security, the environmental costs of militarism. I'm Rachel Rowlands from Sheffield Creative Action for Peace, known as Scrap. And with me also from Scrap, um, we're actually sitting here together, are uh, Hilary Smith. Hi. And Jill Ann Good. Hi. Um, we like doing things together, so we decided to be together. Um, so uh, Hilary and I are co-chairing and Hilary will facilitate the questions. And Jill is going to speak about Scraps activities and in particular our campaigning in support of the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It was hard to come up with a snappy title for this event. We wanted to draw together and make connections between a number of issues. The amount of money spent globally on armaments, money which is needed to tackle poverty and climate change, the carbon emissions from the military, other types of damage to people and environment caused by the military, especially nuclear weapons. The fact that indigenous people and, and, and countries in the global south are most adversely affected by militarization and climate change. True security is founded on cooperation and care for people and planet, not lining the pockets of arms dealers and fueling conflicts around the world. We're very pleased to welcome our two outside speakers, Leona Morgan, who's an Indigenous activist from New Mexico, and Matt Fawcett from Bradford. We're especially grateful to Leona for making time amid her exam schedule by getting up at 5am to give a presentation about the effects of nuclear colonialism on her people and land. So welcome Leona and over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanna just check if my volume is okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you so much. Um, well, I have uh, some slides for you all and I have about a 20 minute presentation. Um, right now, I just wanna explain that um, I know um, this is not a, a presentation on the, the history of Indigenous people in the United States, but um, I recently spoke with a reporter from Belgium, and um, I also have been in touch with other folks in other parts of the United States recently who um, don't know much about the history of Indigenous peoples. So I know this is not part of my presentation, but I'm just going to spend a couple minutes um, to, to highlight some, some um, things that are in my presentation before I start. Um, the first thing I want to do is introduce myself in my language. And so this is just a way to um, identify our relatives and, 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 and present ourselves to um, the universe, I guess, is, as it were. So, um, so hello over there, um, good afternoon. Um, in the United States, we have um, uh, about more than 570 
different indigenous nations that are recognized by the United States government. So there's actually more um, indigenous people in that, but they're just not recognized by the federal government. We have, um, so that's just in the United States. And then there's hundreds of more indigenous peoples um, in Canada, Mexico. Of, so we, you know, Turtle Island is what we call North America, um, but also in South America and um, other parts of the world. Of course, there's indigenous people everywhere. And the presentation I have, it's, it's really just focused on my people, um, which is Diné, and um, a lot of folks might know us more as, as Navajo is a common um, name that was forced on us. So through colonization, um, there was a lot of uh, changes. I Just to summarize, uh, a lot of changes is, is a very nice way to put it, but um, I think um, if there's any questions, you can put it in the chat and I can explain further, but um, I'll, I'll explain more in the presentation about the history um, and I think just important, something important to know, um, it, we're all, indigenous people are still alive. Um, I don't know if people are basing their ideas of indigenous people maybe on Hollywood or maybe you read Karl May or maybe even, um, you know, other authors that have erroneous, erroneously captured fantasy about indigenous people. So a lot of that is not true. Um, and so a lot of us here today in the US have a balance of life within the colonized United States, the modern world, and then also our traditional lives. So th there's a lot of people who still speak the language and do um, traditional practices and all of that. So we are, there's a lot of us alive, thousands of us all over the world is, is the point. Okay, so I will start now with my presentation. Um, I, I'm not sure how, ma how many of you are familiar with the United States. Uh, I'll be, like I said, mostly speaking about my people. And I am located right now in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And um, there's a big fire going on in our state. Um, I don't know if that helps to orient people. Um, so that's something that's happening in the United States. Um, Right now, there is no uranium mining in um, New Mexico and my part of the country. Um, just, to, just to highlight that, we're not dealing with that right now, but it is something of concern as things are happening in, in, in the Ukraine and um, with the lack of Russian uranium. So that's something that we can talk about later. Um, my presentation starts out uh, explaining a little bit a uh, little bit more globally, uh, what is nuclear colonialism? And then I'm gonna focus on two issues, which is uranium mining um, and the waste, as well as waste from high, high level radioactive waste from nuclear power plants. Um, okay, so this here is a picture of um, where my people are from. I live, um, I said I live in Albuquerque, but our land is uh, pretty large as uh, Diné people. We have one of the largest um, land areas uh, known as the Navajo Nation, um, which covers um, in, in a lot of uh, in expanse, I, I want to say acres, but I know that might not mean much to you all over there. I'm not sure how many square kilometers, but it's the size of West Virginia. So if you look at a United States map, um, or if you just Google, you can Google Navajo Nation. Um, but even that, it won't bring up the entire Navajo Nation, um, which is what I'll explain. Um, this particular site was used in a lot of those Hollywood movies that I mentioned. Um, it's called Monument Valley, and it's right on the border of Utah and Arizona. So we're in the our reservation, um, which is a legal space, is you know a little bit in Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. Um, and this spot here, it's a beautiful landscape. You can see the moon rising. Um, this is a place that has been contaminated by uranium. We have over. 500 sites on the Navajo Nation. Um, so the, the idea, um, I'm gonna show you this map a couple of times, but um, you'll, see, you'll see a couple of maps and, and most of them are gonna focus on the Navajo Nation, which is um, this basic shape here. So I'm, I'm showing this slide first because right now this is one of the most important um, newest things that's going on in the United States, uh, Pinyon Plain or Canyon Mine. This is a mine at the Grand Canyon. It was just granted its license um, 
last week or recently, I think two weeks ago, they the the their license to mine was issued. And so the Havasupai people, there's a lot of the indigenous people who are from the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Um, they have been fighting this for a long time and um, they lost their lawsuit. So they were fighting this on the grounds of uh, various things. I mean, it had a lot to do with the water if it had been if it becomes contaminated from the uranium mining, um, because water is the source of life. We drink water, we use water, but then also for them, they use water for cultural purposes. And so the Pinon Plain Grand Canyon mine is located here. This is in Arizona around the Grand Canyon. The transport route is this red line. Um, so the uranium would go through Navajo Nation um, to process at the mill. There's only one mill in the country that's operating but it hasn't processed uranium in a long time because there's just not enough uranium being mined. Um, recently, there has not been. So White Mesa Mill has been processing nuclear waste from different parts of the world um, as a means to stay alive financially. So this company is, um, they're in business, they're doing a lot of bad things. And I think one of the things that they're doing um, in the media is that they're also advertising, they're in business, um, to take waste from uranium sites to clean it up. So this is a, a different issue that I'll get into, but the, the reason I'm bringing this up is because the, the mill is near the community of the Ute Mountain Ute people. So this is a completely different indigenous nation. So they wanna, the company that wants to mine is, is, is proposing to desecrate a sacred water, a cultural water, uh, you know, water for life over here. And then we're concerned about the transport through a city. And then there's also a river here um, and then a, a Hopi community. So this is a different indigenous nation. And then the, the, Diné, the Diné community, which, is, which um, is my people. So we have several indigenous peoples just along the hall route. Um, there's also other, other nations like the, the Paiute and um, different, um, the, the, the Wallapai. So there's a lot of folks who have come together um, and some of them are in this picture, even from New Mexico, um, we have some Pueblos and, and Mexican indigenous people. So this is just a show of, for me to explain, um, there's a lot of indigenous organizing happening in the United States around these sites, and there's different strategies and things like that. But um, we often have to work with uh, non-native allies. So big NGOs partnering with groups like uh, the Sierra Club and, and folks like that. But these are very different fights. Um, they take very different strategies. Um, and so this is kind of where my work is unique that I work in both of these arenas where I do work with a lot of older white folks um, in the United States on the coast, on both of the coasts and the coastal regions. But my reason for doing this work is because of my homelands, um, my family and you know our relatives, people that have suffered from uh, the uranium mining. So I have relatives who have died from cancers and other things that I, I know is from the uranium. But it started a lot, a lot um, much, much before the uranium mining started. This map shows it's called nuclear, I mean, sorry, resource colonialism. Um, so again, going back to the history of my nation, um, this here says the Navajo reservation. And it's hard to summarize in this one presentation, but um, there's a lot of uh, readings and other research that has gone into this, if people are interested in this. Um, there's also uh, other issues that are very related to uranium mining, um, which is other resource extraction that occurred. So for example, coal mining, um, our nation actually exists because of coal mining. The United States and the, the, the existing companies, um, they didn't have a, a legal entity to sign coal leases with. So this is one, well, there's a, there's a lot more to it, but essentially our, our nation as the Navajo Nation is a Western construct. This is not something we created. Um, we had our own system of governance when I introduced myself. Um, that's part of our system before colonization. So, so colonization occurred 
a lot of it through systematic dispossession of lands um, legally by mining and other means. So like the railroads, for example. So all of these um, different types of expansion through uh, white settler colonialism um, included, it was very systematic and, 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 and designed to, to just, you know, take away our land inch by inch and then eventually starting to go, you know, subsurface. So not just taking the land, but also the resources, which we're seeing happening today with water. We have uh, water scarcity. Um, we saw it with coal mining and then uranium. And then there's also uh, a lot of fracking happening now. And then there's this new issue. We're not sure how it relates, but um, our Navajo Nation government wants to develop helium. And the people, the, the local community people are really against it. So we're fighting our own government on that level. Um, so here's some of the, the pictures of the fracking. Um, it's, 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 it's incredible. Um, and these are areas where there is uranium in the ground. Um, <clears throat> I'm giving a lot of background and um, I know that's not gonna give me a lot of time to focus on the nuclear stuff, but I think it's really important to understand the complexity of, of the laws and how um, all of the other impacts from other resource extraction. And then we had COVID impact our people very intensely. Um, and, and a lot of us attribute that to the loss of water from the past mining. So some of the um, people that were hurt very badly were in this region here, we'll just say this region. But um, I think some of you may have seen in the news, the Navajo Nation had very high COVID numbers. I mean, how do we keep you know washing our hands for 20 seconds when people about a third of our people don't have running water in the home. So, you know, people talk about indigenous nations as third world world countries inside of the United States. Um, yeah, this is this is this is accurate. Um, on the Navajo Nation, there's a lot of people who still live without running water and electricity. Um, maybe one or the other, but uh, we're we're it we're eventually going to have you know most people with running water and electricity, but some people choose not to have it um, just because of the infrastructure, the change in the way of life, the disruption to the land. Um, so I, I don't think we will ever have 100% um, of our population with running water and electricity, um, which brings into the you know, in, in, into question electricity as a, a nation that's producing coal and you know oil and gas and uranium, all of that energy is being exported. We do not retain any of that energy. We, we, get some of it through the, the grid, it comes back to us, we buy it back. Um, but the Navajo Nation does not have its own utility company that, that creates electricity. Um, we do have a utility company. Um, I'm not going to get into that. But uh, this map shows the different areas on the reservation that were impacted by uranium mining. Now you can see there's uh, these little brown dots here. Our Navajo Nation is not just one land. There's a big place in the middle. This is a, a different nation. So this is a, a window of a different nation. And inside of that nation, we have a little bit of Navajo Nation here and then Navajo Nation outside. And then off the map, there's more. So our nation and our land is, is not contiguous, which means we have a law. Um, when we have a law, it doesn't apply in those places where um, our jurisdiction doesn't doesn't um, is not respected. So, like, let's say here, you know, if we have a Navajo Nation law that says no uranium mine, no uranium mining, the the Hopi Nation has their own laws. Um, so, the United States doesn't respect our laws is basically what I'm getting at. Um, Navajo Nation they passed the law to say no uranium mining in 2005, and then no transport of uranium. But these are hard to enforce when we have um, the colonizing government um, with their laws, which supersede our laws. So this is another reason why uranium mining and all of these things happen, even when we try to protect ourselves, our, our sovereignty is not respected. Um, okay, so that's just a lot of background. I'm going to spend at least at least five minutes on the nuclear side of things. You can read this um, definition here. Um, essentially, nuclear colonialism, uh, it's the ongoing practice of colonization. So the ongoing practice of genocide and, and taking of our land, and it's, it's just turned into this other 
um, form of colonization that is now invisible. So people don't really see nuclearism. It's um, the, it was very well designed by the government to keep it secret. So a lot of folks don't question um, you know, how many billions of dollars we're putting into the nuclear industry. So this, this industry, it's still hurting our people and about 75% of uh, uranium activities occur on indigenous lands worldwide. So when indigenous peoples are fighting nuclear colonialism and we're trying to protect our homelands, a lot of us are protecting our traditions and our prayers and our way of life, which includes praying and, and protection for the whole mother earth and, and even the, the whole universe. So we're not just doing this for ourselves, you know, essentially we're doing this for the balance of our mother earth. And um, if, as you can see from the definition, it includes all of the different processes from uh, nuclear development, both weapons and, and energy, as well as the, the, the testing and the nuclear waste storage. Um, all the different types of waste. Um, this is what, when they try to store nuclear waste in our homelands, um, we consider this as being targeted as a national sacrifice zone. So a lot of our places have been very um, contaminated um, as you saw on the map. And in the United States, we have um, over 15,000 abandoned uranium mines. Um, so what is uranium used for? Well, I think all of you know, obviously we have uh, weapons and then this is a power plant that recently shut down. Um, and right now in the United States, we're dealing with uh, a lot of old reactors. So nearly a hundred reactors at about 70 sites, I'm estimating, and a lot of them are shutting down um, and, and some of them are getting life extensions, uh, but all of them um, have nowhere to put the waste. And that's the, the biggest issue, I think, not just in, in the United States, but globally. Um, as you can see, the, this is a, a map depicting the different uses of nuclear weapons. And um, by far, the most weapons were tested in Nevada in the United States, um, over 900 tests, um, uh, different, different kinds of tests. I think it's actually more than that, but um, this mushroom cloud represents um, those tests that were first impacting the Western Shoshone, and then of course the fallout went across the United States um, eastward. So um, not just weapons testing, also I wanna include in nuclear, in nuclear colonialism, also human testing. So as we've, um, some of us know about the Marshall Islands and other incidences of um, horrible things that our governments have done to our people. Um, Okay, so one of the biggest issues that I think, um, I don't know how much you all work on this, but I, I really think this is one of the biggest issues in the world today is, is the myth that nuclear energy is a solution for climate change. So a lot of my discussion is up here in what we call the front end of the nuclear fuel chain um, with uranium mining and processing, and then of course, fuel fabrication into nuclear um, energy. This doesn't include the weapons. I think we'll hear more about the weapons side next. Um, but each stage, it creates different types of waste. And especially in the West, in the desert, um, some of the waste, you know, to contain it, it requires, wa it requires water and we're lacking water. So um, right now we're facing this, um, this huge monster, uh, basically different world scientists and governments saying that nuclear energy is clean or that it's uh, uh, the, the, the going to save us um, from climate change. The reason they say that is because they are only counting the carbon footprint of the, the exhaust, the, 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 what comes out of the nuclear power plant. They are not counting, they're counting just the power plant, the construction, the, the operation, and then deconstruction but not any of the um, steps before the power plant and definitely not the storage of the waste after the power plant, which needs to be monitored and kept safe um, basically forever because this stuff will be radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years. This is the issue I work on the most. There's nowhere to put the waste, but the proposal is to bring it to New Mexico. And the reason why um, we say um, nuclear is, is not a, a solution to climate change is because Obviously, all of the it's a miscalculation of the carbon footprint if they're only looking at this, which is basically steam and, and some radiation um, and heat. But um, we as indigenous people have always been erased. So just 
by not including us in that carbon footprint is not only erasing and, and not calculating the carbon footprint, but it's erasing all indigenous peoples and people dealing with the waste. And anybody living near those other places that have been contaminated that we don't count, we are expendable. And so um, my time is up and I know I have like a lot more slides. So I'm just gonna run through it. I spoke about a lot of this, the history of the United States, the 15,000 abandoned uranium mines, nowhere to put the waste. These are some of the mills, the blue squares are the mills. We had the largest uranium spill in the world. Um, right now they're trying to clean up this area, culture truck on New Mexico. There's a lot more to it. Um, the cleanup is not a good idea, but it's what the government is forcing on us. And there's a lot of uranium mining near sacred places all over the country, um, different nations. Um, so this is the Grand Canyon. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on the United States, but again, this is worldwide. And I'll just end with this, 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 uh, um, this slide here. I have more maps if people have questions about any of the other issues, but I think one of the greatest issues here, excuse my note about adding info, um, that's a note to myself. Um, in 2006, you can see how the price of uranium peaked. A lot of the uranium companies were trying to come back and start mining again um, because the boom of from World War II and the Cold War, that was like 1950s to the 1970s. And we haven't had any uranium mining really, but now you can see as the price is creeping back up, we might be threatened with new mining. And whether that's for war or energy, this is not a this is not a good idea. Uranium is not a, it's, it's not sustainable. And um, I'm not even gonna get into the war aspect. We don't want to use uranium from our sacred places to kill people in other parts of the world. Um, that also violates our cultural ways. Um, so yeah, there's a lot more to my presentation and then also about the nuclear waste proposal. This is one map that just to give you an idea where all the power plants are and where they wanna put the waste. So my nation is right there. And this is the last slide I'll show. So thank you so much for having me. I went a little bit over time, I appreciate it. Um, and then I'll take some questions, I think. Um, and then any discussion later, I'll be happy to um, also answer more later if, if however you wanna do it, thanks. Thank, thanks so much, Leona. It's uh, Hillary speaking from Scrap. Um, Can you the video on please, Hillary? Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks so much. Actually, you haven't gone over, mm -hmm. over time and we really appreciate um, asking you to cover such a range of issues and especially to those of us that aren't aren't familiar with the United States and the geography. Can I just ask, is your presentation available online so that people can look at it more um, slowly? Just there, there's some forms of the presentation. I have given the presentation um, and, and it's been recorded. So you can find it, but I don't have the slides available because it, I really need to add the sources. So just to make sure my information is accurate and up to date. Um, there's a lot of links I need to add, but I don't know when I can do that. I can send you a, a PDF of, of, of this without the, without all of that sure okay thanks so if people have questions we we can have about ten, up to 10 minutes for questions and if you can put them in the q a box which is should be uh, if you're on a laptop at the bottom of your screen just to probably just to the left of um chat uh, maybe i'll kick off with a question while people are having a think i know someone's referred to a map, but I'm not sure which map they're referring to. So it, it's a bit of a, a wider question, but it, you refer to the fact that that nuclear waste, nuclear colonialism is a is an issue for indigenous peoples all over the world. Do you do the groups that you work with um, in New Mexico? Do you have links with indigenous peoples who are fighting the same issues in other parts of the world, Leona? Um, yeah, I, so for me personally, um, I, I need to explain that, um, I'm not a typical 
um, anti-nuclear activists. I, in the United States, a lot of the anti-nuclear activists are, are older people. I'm 40 people. I saw that you called me young in your <laughs> so, so nice. But um, typically the anti-nuclear activists in the United States is in, um, let's say over 50, over 60, even higher up over mm -hmm. 70, over 80 year old uh, white male, a lot of the times uh, white people. Um, and so for myself as a native person, especially um, coming from a place so impacted by uranium, I never lived in a contaminated area. Um, so I am privileged in that way. So some people might think I'm not impacted, but I know my my family has been impacted and where I'm going to move in my 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 future home back on the reservation. Um, this is a place that will always be threatened. So I'm always going to be working on this issue on a personal level. But because of my connections and my organizing, I've traveled to Europe many times. I've traveled to Japan. I've traveled to different places in Canada. And of course, extensively through the United throughout the United States. And so that's not normal for a lot of other uranium, anti-uranium activists. And a lot of the people I visited, um, one of the groups I work with, just I, I'm, I'm interrupting myself, but um, I have the connections to indigenous peoples through the uranium mining fight. And then we also have um, a big network called it's actually um, not an indigenous network, but we found a place within it. It's a network in US in the US and Canada called the Western Mining Action Network. It's just a, a lot of different folks fighting mining, any kind of mining. So lawyers, activists, indigenous people, engineers, mm -hmm. all these different people. But within that network, the indigenous community, we call it the indigenous caucus, we have so many people in Canada and the US fighting lead mining, graphite mining, um, various types of mining. And the point I'm trying to make is all of us have, I would say a very similar story about how these companies came in, people didn't know what was happening, people needed jobs, some people signed agreements they didn't understand, our governments, our tribal indigenous governments did that. Um, and, and then all of a sudden they were gone, the company was gone. Um, and then some people had jobs, but the ultimate reality is the money left and we were, you know, we were still there dealing with contaminated water, land and health problems. So it's almost the same story all over the world. You can just put in a different resource or mineral, whatever they're taking, and then, and then a different community and the impacts are are very tremendous when it comes to traditional people who are still using you know the water for ceremony i said i live in the city so again i am indigenous and 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 when i go home and i practice um our traditions and the things that i do that's that's very sacred to me but i'm living in the city and so right now um it's it's hard for me as an indigenous person to be in the city doing these things. So when I move home, you know, it's going to be really different. And being in the city, it's easy for me to go to the airport and fly around. But the reality is for some of these people living in these places, um, just to go to a meeting, they might have to drive in the car for two hours to get to the airport. And then from the airport, you know, spend the night, fly somewhere, and all of this takes money and time, and people just don't have the resources sometimes even just to travel. So with Zoom, it's made things a lot easier. However, in indigenous communities, a lot of us, um, a lot of places don't have high, you know, don't, don't have internet access, or sometimes there's not even cell phone access. So one of the meetings um, we had uh, during the pandemic, it there were several meetings that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission held you know, these are public meetings where the public, you, normally we go in person and then we make our three minute speech. Um, all of this was done over Zoom and, and it totally shut down the voices of people in places that didn't have, you know, internet or, or phone. So with this particular government agency, you had to have not just the phone or the internet. Um, if you wanted to see the slides, you had to have the internet to see the visual 
and a phone to hear. So everybody thought, how can this government entity that can't even manage, a, it's not Zoom, they use some other platform, but we thought, you know, how can we trust them if they can't even manage a public meeting process? And of course they went with their public meeting process. And at this moment in time, the company we're fighting is called Holtec. And um, this is the company that wants to bring all of the waste from the power plants to New Mexico. Um, essentially the government is going to license this project any day now. So our big fight against Holtec that's been, you know, for years, um, we've always known the government is going to license this um, high level radioactive waste dump. And um, the, the thing about it is, I'm just going to share my slide to give people an idea about, about this. Um, the, the big fight that we're doing, um, it's not necessarily in an indigenous community. Um, the thing about it is this is a place where uh, in New Mexico, okay, so I'm going to go back to this slide. Um, I had showed you all the, um, the, uh, the, 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 where the uranium is. So the uranium deposits in the United States are, um, excuse me, let me get this back up here. The uranium deposits are mostly in the West. And then right now, the, most of the power plants are in the East and the, some in the West Coast. But if you overlap those two maps, you can see how there's really no power plants where the uranium is. So they take the resources and then you know use them somewhere else. Other people get the electricity, but then they want to bring the waste and dump it back on us, which is right there. So this is just an egregious form of um, what we call environmental racism because the state as a whole, New Mexico is mostly people of color and we have about 25, well, um, 23, I'd say, indigenous nations that are recognized, um, some unrecognized. So again, here's my, my homeland, and the transport to the, the waste sites would be by rail. So all across the whole country, everyone would be um, at risk through this transport. Um, but um, yeah, so the company and all of this, uh, the United States is, is going to be licensing this facility any day now. Um, and the location, this is a map of southeastern New Mexico, very zoomed in. There's a one site, here, there's two proposals. The one that we're fighting is the biggest one, it's here. Just 40 miles to the east is a second proposal. Uh, and the company Waste Control Specialist is actually in partnership with Orano. So we're worried that one day they might be trying to transport waste from France. Um, so right now, these two sites um, have not taken any waste. This one was already licensed, so technically it can start taking waste, and then this one will be licensed very soon. However, both of these sites, they're called, um, they're also within a fracking region. So this, the, all these um, white lines, this is, this is one of the world's largest oil producing areas. Well, in, the, in our country, it's probably the largest. So um, yeah. The area you asked if there's indigenous people, I'm bringing up this waste issue and just comparing it because um, right now we know that the government, the United States is gonna issue these two permits and um, I'm just showing other pictures. I'm, that's probably gonna be distracting. Um, we're saying that the site is illegal yet the government, we, we always knew they're gonna do this. Um, the, the point I'm trying to make is I don't know how much of you, what you all call your different sites. Um, they had a site like this in Spain. Um, CIS stands for Consolidated Interim Storage. So these two proposals, these are only temporary because I'm saying temporary um, because there's nowhere to put them permanently. And a temporary site is not legal. There's a lot of technical, there's a lot of legal uh, language that goes in there, but really the United States and other places need permanent sites. So the idea is let's just park it in New Mexico for a hundred years until we build a permanent site. In a hundred years, we'll probably have the technology to build a permanent site. So we'll just put it in New Mexico and then we'll move it a second time. So this is one of the biggest issues because we know that there's no place to put it now. And if they bring it once, they're never gonna, it's never gonna leave. So this is what's being told to us is it's just a temporary site, but we think it's gonna become permanent. 
And so the transport, earlier I showed a map of the transport just for uranium. Well, this waste is way more toxic than just uranium waste from a mine. Sorry to interrupt you, Lena, just where there's one or two other questions. I know you're running out of time in this section. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I didn't um, the other questions. No, thank you. But yeah, so the transport just to this one site would be across the whole country. And, and the idea is to do it twice. So that's not just impacting my nation. It's impacting every indigenous people in the country and all the non-natives. It's a national issue. It's not just an indigenous issue. Okay. So what's next? Yeah, just to fit, I mean, there's just because of time, there's a couple of questions. You've sort of partly started to address it about some of the challenges about involving people in campaigning, but I think people are interested in in what debates there are within the communities about the, the strategies that you that, that you pursue in this campaigning. But just really briefly, I know it's, that that's another huge question. Okay, um, really briefly, again, just my nation, only for Navajo Nation. Of course. Navajo Nation is the Western government. So locally, they want to make economic development. They want to, and, and our nation tends to want to do fracking and, and you know, they have to make money is, is what they wanna do. So there's a disagreement with the local people, the community people, and then we have the, the, the government, but then we also have the medicine people. So the people that carry the knowledge, the traditional people that are continuing our way of life. So we have those three different perspectives and there's always a conflict. Most of the time, the medicine people and the traditional people and the community, the general public are usually in alignment and, and in conflict with our Navajo Nation government which tends to work with corporations and the United States government. So this is, those are some conflicts. I mentioned cleanup. Um, the 15,000 abandoned uranium mines in the, in the United States, there's no law to clean them up, but there is some cleanup happening on Navajo Nation, specifically 523 mines. And the cleanup is being dominated by the United States EPA. Our government, tries to get involved, but doesn't have a vote at the table. They get a seat at the table, but they don't, they don't really have any decision-making authority. So when the local community people are trying to get our government, you know, to pay attention to the local issue, whether it's uranium mining, fracking or whatever, sometimes they might even be at odds with the local people. In the case of Church Rock, our government is trying to support the local people to get a better cleanup deal, but the federal government is saying, this is the best deal you're going to get um, unless you wait another 10 years. So the community, and this is a very complex issue. Maybe if there's more time at the end, I can talk about this one specific issue. Thank, thanks so much, Leona. Yeah. I'm sorry to, no, to that's cut okay. you off. We gave you an impossible task, really, <laughs> no, <it's laughs> what fine. we were I... asking you to cover. But thanks for introducing some of the issues so well. I'm going to move straight on to Matt, who's going to talk for about 15 minutes on a more UK perspective and the issue of military spending um, and our climate emergency. So Matt, if I can hand over to you now. Absolutely. Um, I, can you all hear and see me? Can't see you, Matt, but we can hear you. Ah, um, OK, let's see if I can amend that. Um, I'll just, uh, apologies. So hopefully uh, you can see my slideshow as well now. Yeah, it's just, uh, I think your computer's just thinking, I think. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I'm sorry about about these um, seeming connection issues. Let me just stop that share and then try that again. Um, okay, is that is that all visible? I, yeah, I can see your presentation, but if you put it on present mode, that would be great.
or maybe just click through the sides, Matt. It seems to be slightly grayscaled, if you see what I mean, not full screen. Yeah, we absolutely. Can still, we, we can um, still read it, though, so maybe if you can't get it to work, maybe just talk through it like that. Apologies, everyone. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Um, yeah, Matt, so... I might be able to help if you just stop your screen share. I oh, yeah, think that on. stop your screen share, and then at the bottom of your presentation, if you click the little presentation button, it's on the bottom right. It looks like a, it's a tiny, you know, the one that shows the PowerPoint. And oh, then do your screen share. Yeah, it's not a PowerPoint, sadly. That's probably the probably the issue. So, um, so yeah, I'll just introduce myself. So my name is Matt, Matt Fawcett. Um, I'm the UK coordinator for the global campaign on military spending. Um, it's probably also worth saying in this context um, that I uh, work four days a week for a community energy uh, co-op uh, here in, in Manchester. So I, um, uh, yeah, so I, I very much come from, from, from this, from sort of both sides of the, of the climate debate. Can you see this? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Cheers, cheers, Chris. Um, so, um, so oh, yeah. Matt, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. It's a Google presentation, right? Yes. Okay, so with Google, you can um, at the top there is a way. It says it says I think it's a yellow window at the on the top right, a yellow button at the top right that says. Uh, okay, I think, I think show. It seems to be working now. I think I think I'm full screen now. Am I? Yeah. Yes, you are. Yeah, you're fine. Yeah. All good. Right, excellent. So I will start off with uh, talking about war, war fighting and the the impacts of that. So I think that's important within the context of um, the the situation that we're seeing uh, currently in Ukraine, the destruction that we're seeing every night on our on our um, on our TV screens, and obviously any uh, bomb, whether it falls completely off target in the middle of a field somewhere. The, it's still distributing toxins and heavy metals into the local environment. But the main thing that we're going to focus on today is uh, the climate impacts of militarism. Um, so we've seen uh, the targeting of infrastructure in Ukraine, um, particularly uh, uh, fossil fuel infrastructure, so oil refineries. You'll see here the um, firefighters who obviously are uh, having to focus on those fires and the um, uh, and the uh, fires in urban areas, uh, which means that they're not able to tackle any of the significant um, forest fires that, that, the, that are also being caused as part of this ongoing process. And this is something which is very common in war. Um, so uh, these, these photos here are from uh, Iraq in 2017, uh, with, when uh, ISIS were retreating um, but we've seen we saw similar things in the second gulf war where um, oil wells were were set on fire um, and that sort of destruction that that environmental destruction goes very much beyond the bombing really so um uh so you know largest oil leak in uh in in history uh in kuwait during the first first gulf war half a billion uh, gallons of oil released directly into the gulf um and there's also the the uh, the fact that governability becomes virtually impossible um, uh, in a conflict situation. So you get, uh, for example, the massive increase in illegal logging in Afghanistan, um, or the replacement of of the standard electricity grid, which was destroyed um, uh, by thousands of diesel diesel generators. And that's before we even think about the, the impact of reconstruction, which is obviously very significant from a, from a climate point of view. But the main thing I want to talk about here really is the impact that the military has before any bombs have been dropped. Um, and, um, and, and the main issue here is that, is that what, what is the impact of the military? And the simple fact is that we don't know from a, from a climate point of view, because unlike every other um, area of human activity, which is subject to carbon reporting and reduction targets, uh, the global military uh, is excluded. So uh, UK Convention on Climate Change does not require governments to report military emissions, so most don't, don't do it. Um, and this all stems from, uh, from an exemption um, for military missions that was uh, negotiated at, at Kyoto. There have been many subsequent attempts to try and close this loophole. Um, 
but uh, um, we, we're still in a position where there is no uh, definition of, of, of how military emissions ought to be calculated and any, any information whatsoever is, is, is entirely voluntary. So there's, there's, a, there's some really good campaigning happening on this at the moment. Uh, there was lots of talk about this at COP26. At COP, um, Hopefully we'll see more um, uh, in the upcoming negotiations. So, there's a new website called militaryemissions.org, which really helps to identify that military emissions gap. So we're, so we're fortunate that we've got some really good public um, researchers. So particularly uh, in the US context, the Cost of War Project at Brown University, um, which looks at the impact of the US military. So they say the US military is the largest single source of greenhouse gas emissions in the world with a carbon footprint greater than that of most countries. If the Pentagon were a country, its fuel use alone would make it the world's 47th largest emitter. But, you know, the UK is, the, uh, the, the US is the largest military in the world, so, you know, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's uh, limited to them. But um, uh, a report by the Scientists for Global Responsibility calculates that uh, UK uh, annual emissions uh, are greater than, uh, from, from the military industrial sector, are greater than 60 individual countries. So equivalent to around 6 million UK cars annually. So overall, um, uh, the same organization estimates that, and, and an estimate is all we can do um, until we, until we uh, enforce um, uh, uh, stricter reporting um, regimes. But the, um, that the that the military sector could contribute as much as six percent of total global greenhouse em gas emissions. So that's far greater than the sort of um, traditional totems of of, um, of civilian aviation, for example. So um, so it's a very significant uh, impact. And I also want to talk about what what we are not investing in, and what and what um, what how we are not. Um, providing security by when we're investing in armaments. Uh, so most people um, I'm sure will be aware of the UK net zero strategy that was announced last year. And there's been lots of hand, hand wringing uh, in newspapers and from politicians um, around whether the UK can afford the net zero strategy. But you'll see far less about whether the UK can afford its uh, current military strategy. So um, here we have all of the uh, sections broken down by their um, theme, all the ones that relate to reducing UK carbon emissions, be that the heat and building strategy or um, uh, investments in uh, the electrification and transportation. And you'll see that all of them are dwarfed by our current levels of military spending. So essentially, and this is the, uh, if you take away one thing from my presentation, I'd like it to be this, because this is the thing that we need to shout about really. Um, so for every one pound that we're currently investing in reducing UK carbon emissions, we spend uh, seven pounds 45 on the UK military. So this is, it's, um, it's uh, entirely unacceptable for us to be discussing whether we can afford to tackle climate change when it is the single most um, pressing issue threatening the security of um, uh, not, not only British people, but people around the world. Um, and, what, and what else could we do with that, with that money? So, um, so um, I, uh, this is just one example. So the UK has the worst performing homes in Europe in terms of energy efficiency. Um, uh, last year, the, uh, the New Economics Foundation released a, a really great report called The Great Homes Upgrade, which fully costed um, a national program to, um, to retrofit houses across the UK. So um, creating um, hundreds of thousands of jobs, um, reducing uh, fuel poverty, um, uh, reducing our reliance on imported gas, um, as well as tackling our carbon emissions. Um, and, the, the, and the cost of that, this parliament, was less than half the cost of the most recent increase in UK military spending. So, or around about a quarter of what we spend every year on the military in the UK. 
So these are these are very significant amounts of money that hamper our ability to um, to uh, create the kind of society that we want to live in. Um, and they're things that are simply not on the table politically. This is these are discussions which are not are simply not taking place. So we might look internationally. So um, there was a lot of focus at COP26 on climate finance. So uh, 13 years ago at COP15, the rich countries um, uh, uh, made a commitment that they would by 2020 make at, at minimum 100 billion dollars of uh, climate finance available to um, countries that were struggling with the, with the direct impacts of climate change. Um, and they broke that 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 promise. Um, we don't know yet yet know what the figures are for climate finance for 2021, um, but it, it looks very likely that there will be significantly less than than the increase alone that we've seen on military spending. So, and this is something which really has the potential to uh, dramatically undermine trust internationally and our um, ability to get. Um, internationally coordinated climate action in place. Um, so what about the future? So um, we're obviously in a horrendous situation with the with the invasion of Ukraine. We've seen um, a lot of pressure um, for um, an increase in 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 military budgets. We've seen many um, uh, NATO states make um, some very significant uh, additional uh, financial commitments. So um, uh, Germany, for example, um, uh, committing a uh, 100 billion uh, euros uh, of additional money to military spending. So we've seen this from the right of the Conservative Party. We've seen it from the Labour front bench at the um, at the last budget. So, you know, we've seen it from left commentators, right commentators. And this is something that we really need to challenge. So I think it's important to look at where we where we were before this crisis um, began. Uh, so this is the spending um, NATO spending last year compared to the uh, compared to the Cold War. And the reason that I use the Cold War is because it tends to be used by pundits as a, uh, you know, we need to return to Cold War le um, levels of spending. But taken in constant US dollars to, to allow for comparison, we are already spending significantly more than we were during as NATO um, on, on military spending. The, um, the, uh, the theoretical sort of opposing force um, of of Russia, the UK is already outspending was already outspending Russia last year, despite Russia's military build up. As NATO, we outspend Russia. We were already outspending Russia, seventeen and a half to one. Um, with the recent increases, it, it's 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 over twenty to one. So um, so the important thing to say is that is that these theories around um, deterrence or around containment um, that the overspending will in some way uh, deter um, uh, uh, action by Russia is simply not working. It has failed and plowing more and more good money after bad is not our way to get out of the situation that we're in. We need to look at other, at, at other solutions. Um, so this increase in uh, in this push for increased military spending um, to uh, to further benefit the already booming uh, European arms industry, which has seen very dramatic uh, share price increases, um, is also being accompanied by a push for new oil and gas exploration. So we've seen uh, uh, BP approved uh, licenses for new um, new oil and gas exploration in the North Sea. And even though we know that the, the IE, that the IEA and the UN both say that we can have no new uh, oil and gas exploration, and in fact we need to keep uh, much of existing reserves, known reserves, in the ground if we are to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. We're also seeing lots of discussion about, well, can we really afford the level of public services um, that, that, that we're currently providing. Maybe this isn't the moment in the context of the re-emergence of, uh, of, of geopolitics. Um, uh, maybe this isn't really the, uh, the moment to be, um, to be tackling um, uh, 
climate change. And, and the, the important thing to realize is that most of these voices were already saying this before Ukraine, um, but now Ukraine is being used as an excuse and we can't, we can't allow that to, um, to happen. Um, so how do we respond to these to these drums of war really so um so i think it's important to say that the 2021 defense view defense review in the uk already committed a 14 percent budget increase in the military the largest in nearly 70 years so um it also increased the limits limits on uk nuclear weapons by over 40 percent so the uk is currently the third highest spender in the world in terms of its military this militarism is 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 not creating security in fact it's fueling insecurity and instability so we can only establish genuine human security if we work together collectively to face the common existential threats that we all face those are around climate around disease as we've seen with the pandemic and around extreme poverty so i would say you know join join the campaign i'm very pleased to be invited to speak today um, raise these issues in your union branch, raise them with your MP. Please write a response to every one of these articles that you read calling for, you know, for, for, more, for more money for, um, uh, for armaments. It simply is not the solution. It's moving us further and further in the wrong direction and we simply don't have time. So um, I will leave that there, um, and I just want to say um, that uh, I'm happy to distribute these these slides afterwards. So I've just put a few links on there of places that you can go to get um, the sort of latest information on this topic. I really recommend the the, the CIPRI report that came out last week uh, on human security, which is linked there. Um, so yeah, please do please do get involved. Please do raise your voices because you know this is an important time and we've a, a world to win. So thanks very much for your time and thanks for uh, to, for Scrap for inviting me. Thanks very much, Matt. Uh, Scrap, if you'd like to send your video and your microphone on. Unfortunately, Matt, your own personal video doesn't seem to be working, but um, um, we'll uh, hopefully we can still do a sort of Q and A um, now, just just with the audio. Yeah, th yeah. Thank, thanks, Matt. Um, there was a couple of queries in the chat, Matt. What one was um, uh, that somebody had missed? Who had done the work on the? Is it the Great Homes upgrade? One of your earlier slides, um, and also whether we can access the presentation that you've just given us. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'll be. Yeah, I can put the presentation on our on our. On our website, and I think Joe has has suggested that um, that they can distribute it to attendees. I'm very happy for that to happen. So all the links and all the information and the data that I've spoken about is all uh, included in that in that. So please do sort of um, follow 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 up areas of interest. Okay, thanks. Um maybe a question for me that you said I think one of the things that we're really interested in is this issue of the fact that um, the emissions military emissions are not included and in spite of campaigning at COP26 they're still not included so countries aren't including them can you say a little bit more about what what areas of campaigning are going on around that? I mean, is this a live debate or is this a, another a lost debate? I think a lot of the information is quite overwhelming and to be perfectly frank, quite depressing. <laughs> so it's good also to know about what we can do and what, what we can support. I think yeah, I think I think it is very much a live debate. And I think um uh, it's a real shame that my video has just stopped working when it was working in the uh, in the pre yeah. in the pre trial. But uh, I'm holding up a tiny a tiny book that we okay. that we made and distributed a few thousand of at uh, COP26, um, and there was a real uh, interesting moment there. I felt in terms of. Um, a collaboration between the traditional peace movement and the environmental movement. And I think that's how we win. Um, we win by making alliances, making partnerships. Um, and, I, and I think uh, it's really important that we're able to get across uh, just how significant um, 
uh, military emissions are because for every year we aren't counting them they become more significant because you know we are making reductions in other areas certainly from a uk context admittedly not enough but so for every year that we're not counting military emissions they become more significant to the uk overall emissions mm -hmm. yeah Thanks. Um, I, I've just heard from Rachel that we maybe have some copies of the book in in Sheffield, but maybe can you put the title of it in the chat or if we can have that for circulating later? I can. I'll put a link to it. Yeah. And although we've just got another couple of minutes or we can go to to Jill, but uh, if there are any other questions for Matt, um, I think Ju June, who is down as Shell Hill Limited, has raised her hand. So, Joe, I wonder if you could enable her to say her question. That's great. I don't know if you want to put your video on <clears throat> June, um, but you can saw, ask your question. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can. Yeah, we can. Yes, I don't know. I, I can't. I thought I did have it on, so I won't try. And It's okay. Um, we can hear you. Okay, that's fine. I mean, I think these are very difficult times for peace campaigners. Um, but I'm aware there have been a lot of um, anti-war demonstrations across the country. How much, Matt, are you aware of the, is of the issues of, um, you know, the... the a campaign to stop increased military spending. How much has that been raised, as far as you know? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a. Uh, I think th this is this is why we're very keen to get this discussion out there, really, because I think um, I agree that that um, that it can it can often be a difficult time for peace campaigners during times of war because um, it's a. It's a it's a difficult situation when people say to you, well, you know, what are you going to do about the fact that people are dying today? And um, and what we would what we would normally say is that, you know, well, this isn't where this this isn't the route that we should have taken. There were many things that we should have done in advance of this to prevent us getting to this point. Um, and there were a whole range of things that we might suggest for um, uh, doing to uh, to to. Uh, to rapidly end the um, the attack on Ukraine, but I think the important thing to 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 keep underlining is that is that increasing UK military spending or NATO military spending is not going to change the situation there. It is not um, it is not acting tough on uh, on the Ukraine cri the uh, Ukraine crisis. Um, it is not acting tough on Putin. It is not. It is simply none of these things um it's it's not um it's not effective um so um and we're not being asked by uh ukraine to do this so um so we need to be very very clear about that in our resistance because it's very easy to paint um uh this kind of divide of, of a sort of the you know wishy-washy peace nicks with people who want action now and we want action now we want the war to end now but this is not the way to make that happen thanks matt thanks matt um again loads for us to think about um and some reading i think i'm gonna go straight to jill now from scrap from sheffield creative action for peace that's going to tell everybody a little bit more about what we're doing here in Sheffield. Oh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm assuming you can hear me. We're still switched on. Well, after those two presentations, there's just, I could rewrite what I was going to say, but I'll stick to my brief, um, which is to just talk about Scrap and what we're focusing on at the moment. One thing I would say is that because of the difficulty we have in the world at the moment with all sorts of things that are not what we're sympathetic to it's it's easy to become depressed and one thing we do in scrap is is to be to think about the small things we can do locally to maybe work towards the bigger changes we need nationally and internationally and one way we like to do that is we like we like to be active we like to discuss the issues and research them and we also like to make things and that's going to just show some of the things we have made so um 
we've used in the past few years, we've used textile art, knitting, banners, songs and sheets, uh, street theatre. We've made giant weapons that turn into uh, renewable energy windmills. And um, while making or constructing these objects, we also get the chance to talk to each other and become, uh, become more, influ you know, more aware of what we're trying to do. So the main features of our activities are focused on the arms trade and um, the nuclear weapons industry in Britain. And we are increasingly linking that to uh, the environmental impact of nuclear, the nuclear industry and weapons, etc. So at the moment, we're focusing on the illegality of nuclear weapons in terms of international law as well as highlighting their threat to our environment internationally and locally. The owner's presentation was very clear about the fact that the products we use, the countries and places they travel through are environmentally destructive at every point of the way. Um, so the UN Treaty on the Prevention of Nuclear Weapons came into effect through the UN in January this year. 86 countries have signed up to it and now 60 countries have ratified it. That's a fantastic achievement of persistent grassroots campaigning by many different NGOs and civil societies groups. Many of those from countries already struggling with the consequences of nuclear testing, uranium mining, and the devastation of their natural heritage. When we couldn't meet in person because of lockdown, we decided to celebrate those countries who signed by producing a pennant for every country that has gone on to ratify the treaty so far. We also learned a lot by organizing our own webinar. We called it a scrapinar, where we researched the impact of nuclear testing and nuclear wars on various countries represented by these pennants. It was very instructive for us. And I think it's the genesis of why we've picked that, this theme for this event hosted through the Festival of Debate today. Um, so we're now using the pennants to raise awareness of the treaty and to promote the campaign to get the UK government to sign up to it or even engage with it. As you see on our pennants thing, it says, where is the UK in this? Our government is, as has already been said by Matt, investing more in this, in this world than uh, taking on the consequences of doing something that's illegal. So at a local level, we're now trying to get everyone to understand that nuclear weapons and the linked industry of nuclear power bring us no security at all. So we're looking to get Sheffield City Council to pass a motion supporting the nuclear ban treaty and for all our local MPs to sign up to the parliamentary pledge supporting the ban. Some of our MPs already have. Anyone in the UK or I guess elsewhere in the world can get involved in this work to raise the issue with their own local governments and national governments. Um, none of the nuclear power, none of the nuclear weapons holding states have signed up to the ban. So, so we really need um, popular movements to get them to do that. There are plenty of resources on the web, particularly through ICANN, uh, to enable increasing the pressure on our elected representatives. But if you're in Sheffield, please contact us via our Facebook page. We're an open group which meets regularly, now in person, but with Zoom links to those people who can't um, get to the meetings. We're aiming to get a motion of support for the ban through the council this year, have petitions, lesson, letters to councillors to drive this forward. It's often so difficult not to feel powerless in these circumstances. So, for me, the best antidote, antidote to despair is action. And uh, thanks for everybody for adding um, fuel to our flames, really, of an understanding of how all these issues and all and everybody in the world is linked in a need to reduce our, well, just reduce the impact of militarism, war, peace, uranium, the whole myth that nuclear power is a, a clean energy, which Leona really graphically underlined. And we live in an area that used to be heavily exploited by, by the mining industry, coal mining, and 
there's a whole heritage of, again, almost local exploitation, certainly of the labor force and the profits going elsewhere and not benefiting the people who are still struggling with the heritage of that in terms of low employment and environmental devastation. So uh, thanks to everybody for what they've said. And um, yeah, get in touch with Scrap and uh, Yes, I'm handing back to Rachel, and if anyone's got questions to scrap, please put them put them in the um, chat, and we'll be happy to answer. Um, thank you, Jill. Does anyone have any um, further questions for scrap or for either of our previous speakers? Um, I'm looking at the Q and A, and there there don't seem to be more questions at the moment. Um, is is there anything else, um, very briefly, sort of summing up that either Leona or Matt would like to say? Um, Leona first. Oh, I just wanted to say thank you for having me. And I know there's a lot um, I wasn't able to cover, but it's so nice to, to meet all of you. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to keep in touch and I don't need to do another presentation, but um, maybe we can um, have some more discussion. So we, in the United States, we're fighting the nuclear waste battle. We're trying to clean up uranium mines. We're trying to do a lot of this and I know I don't think any of us have hope that the United States is ever going to sign the UN um, treaty on the on the banning the nuclear weapons, but we are there in support and some people are getting their cities and states to do that. And um, maybe one day we will get the United States government to do that. I think that's the ultimate goal for many of us because the United States is the source of a lot of the imperial colonial um, and all of the huge forms of oppression that make nuclear energy and nuclear weapons possible. So thank you so much for the invitation and y'all have a good day. Thank you very, very much for joining us, Leona, um, and particularly for getting up so early in the morning. Um, Matt, would you like to say a few more words? Yeah, I'm sorry for, uh, uh, yeah, it's been a really, really inspiring, inspiring event and particularly hearing from, from Leona, it was absolutely fantastic. And I can only apologise for appearing as a black shape on your screen for the, for the whole session. I think the, the important thing is, is that we need to involve ourselves in these discussions. Um, so there's lots of information out there that, that we can uh, use to inform ourselves. Um, I think, um, you know, we need to be uh, cautious of those who suggest that um, any discussion of UK uh, military spending, US military spending, or NATO military spending is in some is in some how giving sucker to um, to uh, uh, Putin and the Russian invasion. I don't believe that's the case. I believe that we need to have mature discussions about the way that we uh, use our finances and the way that we guarantee the security of our people and the people around the world. Uh, and I believe that we have to do that by facing up to the uh, existential crisis of climate change and doing that at the soonest available opportunity. So, um, so yeah, uh, uh, yeah, down with militarism and up with uh, up with uh, uh, a new a new world. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. That's a, a brilliant way to end. Thank you very very much for your presentation and for joining us. Um, Leon has put some more things in the chat. Sorry, are you um, wanting to wind up now, Joe? I, I was just following your lead there. Carry on, Rachel. Yeah, okay. Um, so there were just a couple more things to say. One was um, that there is a national demonstration on Saturday, the 21st of May, about the sighting of US nuclear weapons at Lake and Heath. We thought we got rid of them years ago and they're trying to bring them back again. If anyone from Sheffield would like a place on a coach, um, you can contact Yorkshire CND 
that's info at yorkshirecnd.org.uk. And if anyone wants to um, get in touch with Scrap because there's something you've missed from this presentation and you want to ask any questions or anything, if you go to our Facebook page, which is in the chat, uh, that gives our email address and do feel free to get in touch. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you very, very much to the Festival of Debate, uh, Joe and Chris, for facilitate Flick for facilitating all of this. Um, sorry, and one last thing was um, if you'd like to donate to Leona's work, I don't know if you um, if there's a way of doing that, Leona, and if you've put that in the chat. Um, Yes, I did. Um, there's several organizations I work with. I didn't name them because I work with right. many. And um, the easiest way is you can send me a donation and I can direct it a certain way. That's uh, my PayPal in the chat, my personal PayPal. And if you in the United States to have a tax deductible donation, we go through a nonprofit. So that's the other link, um, the Indigenous Rights Center uh, link. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. So thanks for everybody for attending and goodbye from us. Bye everyone, just final thanks to everyone from Scrap and Leona and Matt and the full Festival of Debate programme is available on www.festivalofdebate.com. Um, um, thank you for everyone for your time uh, and your efforts and, and, and good day. See, see you later. Cheers, bye-bye. Thanks.